try and connect with things as deeply as I as I can. I mean, I, I love the, the fact in music that there are so many um, so many styles of music that you can explore. So many instruments. I'm a complete sucker for different instruments. Um, but just finding finding your own meaning in you know whatever it is that you're that you're involved with. I I've had absolutely no kind of career path aspirations. I just, you know, here I am, here's a here's a door. I'm to go through it. Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. Philip Griffin is an amazingly versatile, creative, and generous musician based in Australia. He plays, improvises, and composes in many styles on many different instruments. During this episode, you'll hear him play the rabab, the ukulele, and guitar in his duo with violinist Jude Idison. He reflects on his work teaching children and people with disabilities, and reflects on some of his important mentors, including Richard Gill, Lindsay Pollock, and Ross Daly. I discovered Philip through Lindsay, and if you missed my episode with Lindsay, you'll want to check that out as well. I have included timestamps in the description, and like all my episodes, this is available as a podcast and video, and the transcript is also included on my website, leahroseman.com. Everything is linked in the description. Hi, Philip. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thank you. It's particularly cool for me because you're in Brisbane, Australia tomorrow, and I'm tonight here in Ottawa, and I have 30 centimeters of snow outside my window, and I think it's probably quite warm there from the looks of your t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty warm. I, I uh, when I was getting organized this morning, um I had a I had a long sleeve shirt on and it's just it's just too hot. I just can't do it. So um yeah. um yeah, I mean Brisbane isn't the hottest place in Australia, but it's it's pretty humid and I, I don't know, I think we're expecting 30 32 today or something centigrade. Yeah. I so far have featured one other Australian musician, your friend, Lindsay Pollock. So I hope those listeners who haven't heard that episode yet will check it out because he's such an amazing musician and he suggested that I speak with you. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, we've, we've known each other for 40, 40 years and we've been playing on and off um, for uh, a lot of that time. And it's been, yeah, a great, a great privilege to um, have shared many many journeys together. I, I don't know whether you've seen his, his latest project, which is uh, these sunrise sessions. He's done, I think, 18 of them when he gets up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and goes and sets up in, in um, different beautiful places near near where he lives and uh, mainly just plays along um, with a pre-recorded drone and then, um, then improvises uh, one of his wind instruments, which he uh, invents and makes himself, and plays as the sun uh, as the sun rises. Sometimes he does it in collaboration with other people, but most mostly just him. And yeah, the way he produces the videos is also really amazing. Just him recording on an iPad and then shooting with another iPad, and it makes it somehow he makes it look like a you know a multi-camera kind of um, super super high quality production but it's just him and two ipads and his instrument in, in you know in a beautiful place in the sunshine coast so yeah he's he's remarkable i have been following them i haven't seen all of them yet um they're so beautiful yeah. i think you were featured in one of the earlier ones weren't you with your trio with tunji I, I haven't done i haven't done one of those with him no we we did a uh we did a recording of the by griffin pollock trio uh okay. at the at the edge of a lake um but that was that was with actually somebody uh, shooting it, um, mm -hmm. but he did. He recently did one with uh, with Tunji, the other member of the Biograph and Pollock trio. Uh, but yeah, yeah hope, hoping one day to do do one with him. Yeah. And in this trio, what instruments are you playing mostly? So I play plucked stringed instruments uh, in that trio. So oud, uh, rabab, which is an Afghan um, skin topped instrument in the same. But nothing like a banjo. Um, uh, I play laoto, which is a Greek lute, uh, electric bass, 
sometimes guitar, sometimes balalaika. Um, and Lindsay plays all wind instruments, all of which are his own invention and manufacture. Uh, although there is the aspiration to include bass clarinet in um, in that, which would be the first instrument that he hasn't um, invented. But in true Lindsay style, he's made a modification to his uh, bass clarinet that means that he doesn't have to um, carry the the final joint, the the bell, um, and it means he loses one note. The lowest note, but it's significantly heavier and uh, um, significantly lighter and easier to to get around. So yeah, he just can't help himself. He's constantly yeah. inventing and yeah. modifying. And then Tunji Baya um, uh, plays percussion. So yeah, we've got strict mm -hmm. demarcation: wind, strings, and percussion. The Lao you mentioned it's a, like a Greek lute, similar yes. to the oud. Um, it's yes. I mean, the, the oud is the ancestor of all plucked um, stringed instruments with a wooden top. It keeps kind of coming into into Europe and inspiring a new set of instruments. So all all the you know guitars and ukuleles and lutes and um, what whatever else they're they're all derived ultimately from from the oud. These days, the oud is a fretless 11 stringed in six courses is probably the most common and the strings are the same um, uh, construction as a classical guitar strings whereas the lauto is um, there's two main two main sorts i play a greek islands one um, it's four courses each of double strings and they're steel and it has movable nylon frets, um, like fishing line, essentially wrapped around as frets, which you can then slide up and down should you should you need to. Um, but you know, they're bowl backed um, string stringed instruments. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some key key differences. Yes. No, I was just thinking. By the time I release your episode, I will have already released my episodes with uh, oud player Ali El Farouk, and he was um, so he demonstrates his oud a lot. In case people missed that, and all, I was just editing today another episode that's coming out with Adam Hurt playing gourd banjo among other things, and Adam yeah. was saying because uh, the gourd banjo. Are no, they're normally round and he finds it kind of slippery to have this bowl shape but the, yeah. the maker who made his grew the gourd between two boards so it would be flat <laughs> so I was just thinking with all these bold shaped instruments do you find they slip around or are they kind of cumbersome or you're just used to it uh, you kind of get used to it I mean every everyone's slightly slightly different as to what you need to get used to holding it in place um yeah that, that's a good idea i like that um growing growing the gourd between two boards um look you can kind of with the with the wood you can you can kind of wedge it with you know your knee and your um different parts of your arms um oh there are there are certainly other other instruments that there's just nothing there to to grab onto and they're just constantly floating and moving around and your hands are chasing this way and that way and um but no i'm pretty certainly pretty used to it with the with the wood and, and the low um, yeah yeah i mean the guitar is pretty well designed in that uh in that sense with that you know that, that the thing that fits over your leg and and locks it into into place um mm -hmm. but yeah i mean it's just just part of what you've got to learn how to how to manipulate when you're playing these great instruments. So I know later in this episode, you'll be playing the rabab for us, which is kind of an Afghan lute, like more that area of the world. Yeah, it's a, it's from Afghanistan and um, Pakistan. Um, but because it's got a, a skin top, it's in a, in a different branch of the um, quarterphones, I guess, the, to the to the oud. Um, so aud is the root of the English word wood um, and also lute. Al-Aud, yeah, you get lute from that and 
obviously wood. Um, so yeah, all of the descendants of the Ud are wooden topped and then the banjo and the rabab and a whole series of North African instruments um, that have skin tops are in a, a different different branch. So um, yeah. Yeah. So you studied, um, it was in, in Greece that you studied Turkish music? It's when the journey started for me. Um, I was on tour in 1994 with uh, Australian Swiss group Zenos playing um, Balkan gypsy music. And um, we had a series of engagements in Berlin and ar around, around that part of Germany. And um, for a number of years, I'd heard about Ross Daly uh, and people said that he he was somebody that I should try and um, try and meet and have lessons with or connect in some in some way. And when we got to Berlin, um, there were these posters up saying that he was he was going to be playing in Berlin. And until I was able to reconcile my di diary with the uh, with the date that was on the poster, I had a slight sinking feeling that it wouldn't work out, but miraculously it did. And it's a he performed a legendary um, concert, which all of which you can see on YouTube um, uh, with one of the Shemarani um, sons playing um, playing percussion and Socrates Sinopolis playing um, um, playing bowed. Um, strings and Ross playing his his array of instruments and went to see that um, um, incredible concert and met him afterwards and had one lesson with him in in um, Berlin and he said um, you know why don't you come to Athens so uh, yeah it worked out went to Athens had some more lessons with him and that's when that's when I started uh, becoming interested in Turkish classical music. Um, and yeah, that, that that's something that I studied quite seriously for a while there. And I was later living in, um, in the Middle East and I went to Turkey on a number of occasions and um, yeah, different places that I've lived, tried to connect with, with people who, who like playing that music, including yesterday I went and saw two fantastic players who live in, in Brisbane, um, Naraz El Frey and um, Trud, Joseph Trud, um, a nay player and a um, spike fiddle player, and they're just both fantastic in that in that kind of sphere. Um, so, yeah, it's something that I am still love, love playing when I get the opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a way that uh, you worked with Ross that um, was different than other mentors and teachers you'd worked with? I guess so. I mean, Ross, because, you know, ultimately he's, you know, he's got a European background. He's, you know, he studied, he studied, um, or, you know, Western European Anglo kind of background. I mean, his, his initial instruments that he played were classical guitar and cello and things like that. So, I mean, he's come, come into, this other world where he's an absolute master, um, but I guess he recognizes, you know, what what somebody coming from um, the Anglo world kind of needs to to get in into that into that space. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it is Turkish classical music is uh, a notated tradition um there's you know there's many many scores uh of of that vast repertoire i mean it it is a a different way of reading a score uh compared to say western classical music where there's a lot more prescriptive uh elements to um you know reading reading western classical music scores but it's it, you know in some ways it's a bit like a, a, a jazz um, chart where it gives you the bare bones of you know what are the chords what are the what are the notes what's the structure and then 
I mean, you know, you'd never go to a jazz gig and hear anybody play what's written in the real book, for example. Um, that's, you know, it's, it's the same piece, but everybody changes it to suit, you know, their own style and, and who they're playing with and um, on top of, obviously, all the improvisation that happens. And it's the same with, uh, uh, with classical, uh, Turkish classical scores they they show you a a very an unornamented version uh there's no chords involved because it's a non-harmonic um style of of music but it gives you it gives you an outline that you then um elaborate and interestingly when you're playing it in an ensemble setting people are um um are, are elaborating and ornamenting in a different way simultaneously um which is you know kind of a bit different to uh you know say a baroque situation in in western classical music where you know there, there would be a lot of discussion about oh you know how are we going to ornament this and is this going to be a mordant or a this or whatever it is and let's get out of the way so that we can hear this person do do that or um it, it it's a different a different mindset really um where you you hear everybody doing their own version and it, and it adds a level of of uh complexity to the sound but it that's that's just how it how it all works mm -hmm. um i guess i guess partly due to the fact that you're not getting harmony in the way to confuse things so it's all about it's all about melody and microtones and, um, you know, macam and all these kinds of um, yeah, aspects to the music. Mm -hmm. So this would be a natural place to have some rabab music. Do you want to take time to tune it now or would you rather do that later? Yeah, happy to do it now. Uh, sure. This isn't Turkish. This won't be anything to do with Turkish classical music. Some listeners are listening to the podcast version and they can't see what you're playing. So if you could describe this instrument and talk about the kind of music you're going to play on it for us. It's about as long as my leg. Um, it, it's got two big indentations in it like, like a guitar does. Um, but in that area of the instrument, um, there's a skin top. Uh, and on that skin top, there's a bridge with a plethora of strings. Um, there are three playing strings where you can actually play melodies. That's one of them. And, and that one. Then you've got a, a pair of drone strings which are tuned in fifths. So, it, depending on how you view these things, you could say that it's kind of in D. Um, and these these drones are D and A, but this the lowest note you get is C sharp. So the lowest of the strings that you play um, melodies on is C sharp, and then you've got F sharp and D. So if you want to play the the root note, um, you have to put your first finger down, which is pretty different to just about any instrument I've ever ever played. Um, so that's um, that's five strings that are the full length of the of the neck to the bridge and then you've got a series of um, sympathetic strings which um, starts off being um, a major scale with an added um, flat seven and then kind of a, an up hit, a bit of a pentatonic thing finishing up with a high high D up the top um, and these you can either use you can do those kinds of effects or you can just um, allow the um, natural resonance of the instrument to engage those sympathetic strings so um, in terms of describing it it's um, dark brown kind of uh, it's a single apparently a single piece of wood um, from the um, the far right end of the instrument right up to um, right up to where the headstock meets and there's a fairly um, elaborate uh, headstock that that comes back with with carvings and intricate 
handmade um i'll just show that up to the microphone for people who are watching the um watching it uh and it's got this this beautiful little um um curve here which apparently is used for carrying carrying the instrument around when you when you're walking around you can just um you can hold it hold it there i'm just going to be um improvising something Very cool. Thanks. So yeah, it's rhubarb. Um, yeah, it's a, I'm not sure how it how it kind of um, translates to the podcast arena, but uh, when you can hear it in, um, it, it yeah, it's got this beautiful natural reverb that the combination of the of the skin top and the sympathetic strings provide, and certainly in an ensemble mode, it's uh, yeah, it's a really evocative instrument in the in the mix there that was a really cool improvisation thank you philip i was wondering what the first time was that you heard of rebob do you remember uh i'm pretty sure it was also ross um ross daly i was living in um in jerusalem in the late 90s and he he came and did a um a, a kind of a, a camp a music camp in in jerusalem which um i i attended and um he was he was there playing doing some concerts with some local uh israeli musicians that he knew and i was just about to move back to australia and i said to him you know i know a couple of really fantastic players in in australia that it would um i, th- I think it would be great if if you could come and um with his partner Kelly Toma um and I'd suggested that I and Lindsay and Tunji uh accompanied them so and yeah Ross liked the idea at that stage he'd never been to Australia in 2001 they came and we organized a tour yeah we toured up down the east coast from um Kinkin which is where Lindsay was living at that stage and finished up in Melbourne and one of the instruments that Ross brought to play on that tour was a rhubarb when I first met him and and bought 
started buying his recordings. There's um, on an album of his called Selected Works, there's this incredible piece and improvisation for Sarangi and Rabab where he plays mm -hmm. both parts. And uh, that I'm sure that was the first time I heard heard the instrument, but then heard it intimately on our on our tour and then we organized another one and by that stage i decided that i'd really like to get one so on the second tour when he he and kelly came out um he played he played this instrument that i just played for the tour and at the end of it um i i bought it from him and it stayed it stayed here so yeah it's got a very special uh connection uh with with him okay so when I learning about you, you're such an interesting, and um, we really have to dig into to all the things you, you do and are, but you're just so open and flexible as a person and a musician. It really strikes me. And you've managed to create really amazing opportunities for yourself. Well, two things. I think I've been incredibly lucky in my life with the mentors that I've had. And, you know, certainly Lindsay is a colleague, um, and you know that you know we've done lots of, lots of projects together, um, and we're you know we're we're colleagues. But he's also a mentor, um, and he he's the person that first exposed me to um, initially Macedonian folk music. Um, I mean, we met in 1981. Um, and I think soon after, 1982 probably, um, I borrowed his tambura, which is a long-necked lute Macedonian uh, traditional instrument, and he started teaching me music of that tradition. Um, and it was completely outside of my sphere of experience at that stage. I mean, I was um, reasonably proficient on the classical guitar um but i you know yeah that was the, that was my first exposure to you know irregular meters and kind of modal music um and yeah it, it opened it opened a door to a, a world i mean you, you know it's one of the one of those things you can't really you can't really say oh this would have never happened if this hadn't happened but the way that it did happen for me was through the doors that were opened by being in contact with Lindsay and, and learning macedonian music and then turkish music and then you know greek music and um and through turkish music seeing the connection between um turkish classical music and Ottoman classical music more broadly, which, um, uh, you know, a lot of Arab musicians play the same same uh, pieces as, as Turkish classical mu musicians, but uh, with a slightly different slant on them. So you can you can say Ottoman to describe the whole, uh, to describe both of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, Lindsay, Lindsay allowed that path. And then Ross, um, in his in his way, um, certainly opened all sorts of channels for me, which I've explored in in different ways. Hi, just a quick break from the episode. I'm an independent podcaster who does all the many jobs required to produce the series, and there are a lot of costs I bear as well. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip. Or becoming a monthly supporter starting at three dollars canadian which is close to two dollars us or two euros and getting access to unique perks the link is in the description now back to the episode if we could jump back to your singing days i uh, know that you had you had a mentor richard gill who's very important in australia as a singer yes. and conductor and and sort of mu music activist right in terms of education absolutely yeah yeah Richard Gill, um, it's, yeah, I mean, I I was at the Conservatorium in Perth, in Western Australia, on the opposite side of the continent to where I now am, but Perth is where I met Lindsay and where he set up the North Perth Ethnic Music Centre as it was then, and we had groups that played Macedonian music and, and, and other things, um, but I was studying classical guitar I went there in 1984, 
and yeah, that's what I wanted to do, played classical guitar. And Richard Gill arrived in 1985, and he completely changed my my world. And he he had um, choirs, an eight voice choir, which, as you can imagine, had eight people in it. Um, I, I had very little background in singing, but he yeah he just made made it possible for for people to do things that they'd never imagined um and he invited me well he 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 moved to he moved to Perth to be the dean of the conservatorium and for some reason um when he had to go and fulfill other commitments um back in sydney or or whatever he got me as a student to um, take rehearsals of the choir um, in his absence, knowing pretty much nothing about, I didn't even know how to conduct different patterns of, you know, seven fours and things like this. And we were doing Carmina Burana, um, which has got quite a lot of changing time signatures and stuff. And he said, okay, you take the rehearsal while I'm not here. Okay, off you go. And... Um, I'm sure it was excruciating for some of the other people in the choir, but it completely changed my uh, view of what was possible in in music. And after a year of having these experiences, I I finished the course that I was doing in classical guitar and swapped over to doing a, a bachelor in conducting, and uh, which was pretty. I think the I think I was the only person um, doing conducting at an, at an undergraduate level. I mean, I think it's become much more mainstream to be co doing conducting at an early part of your career. But I, my understanding at that point was that that was pretty radical for him to um, encourage and allow this to happen, that, you know, conducting mm -hmm. was something that, you know, people much further into their careers at a postgraduate level did. Mm -hmm. And... Also, as part of that, he, well, it became apparent that a lot of the people that I was going to be conducting were um, singers rather than, you know, there wasn't a huge orchestral program at the conservatorium, but there was quite a lot of singing stuff. So, you know, if you're going to be conducting singers, you better find out a bit about singing. So mm -hmm. I started having singing lessons uh, with, a, with, a, with a teacher and also coaching with him. And we'd go in and we'd do you know, all these, all this operatic repertoire. And I'd go out of the room thinking, I can do this. I can, I can sing. And, you know, just on this absolute high. And that, that's, that's one of the things that, I mean, he's so beloved um, in, in Australian music circles and everybody mm -hmm. has a special connection with him. Um, I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of reluctant to talk about how special it is to me because I know how special it is to ev everybody. He he had this incredible ability to make everybody feel as though they were special. Um, and, you know, you know, tangents all over the place, but, you know, uh, uh, late, later in life, um, or a few few years later, he was the chorus master at the Australian Opera, and I was a young young artist um, as part of young artist uh, young artist development program as a composer conductor, um, and walking around the Sydney Opera House with him, and you know you'd start at you'd start at the stage door, and he'd have this conversation with the person there, and you know, and all these names he had names for everybody, and stories, and there were these things, and then you'd walk through, and then there'd be the mechanists, and he'd he'd know everybody's name, and everybody loved him, and then he'd walk through this the green room, and everybody would you know, and then you'd walk through here, and he'd know everybody's name, and and made everybody feel special in a, a absolutely miraculous way, and it's certainly that. Uh, that time of doing coaching, coaching with him made me think this is something I can do and I love doing. He, um, mm -hmm. And by the end of my um, studies at the the con, I sang the title role in Gianni Schicchi by Puccini, um, mm -hmm. and probably made an absolute, you know, pigs. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was hideous, but it was. Um, fantastic thing to to 
to do and made me uh, yeah again changed my life and also with composition he he thought he taught that you know improvisation and composition was at the center of music education so you know you analyze you you play and you write and you improvise and that's that's what you do so um by the end of um by the end of my course which was in um conducting nominally i sang the the lead in an opera and i was music directing uh musicals within the music theater slash theater school um i was getting uh work in theater as a composer and music director and that's all due to him just making empowering me as a as a musician and mm -hmm. not but not thinking of myself as a classical guitarist but you can do all this stuff um yeah. and yeah i uh, he died a few years ago um but i think of him all the time he's just been such a profound um inspiration and that you know there's facebook groups of the you know richard gill appreciation society and people constantly telling their stories what he did for them um and i was for those years i was in a uniquely privileged position where i had so much one-on-one -on -one contact with him and um i thank the universe for it mm-hmm I, I was reading that towards the end of his life, he started the inaugural um, Sydney Flash Mob Choir. He did so many, uh, so many things. And there's so, um, I, I wasn't there. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure exactly what there are some, like when he died um, in the, the last couple of days, I think maybe the day before he died, this, mm -hmm. the, this guy, Paul Goodchild assembled this massed, brass band um, outside Richard's house in the street in Stanmore in suburban Sydney. And Richard wasn't, he was, you know, kind of lying there, unable to, you know, uh, he wasn't moving or responding very much. But, you know, this brass band appeared outside his house and they played um, the theme from the Dam Busters and the story in all the papers was that it was his favorite piece of music like i say you know you're walking around um you're walking around for example the opera house and he's got all these um these these kind of funny relationships with people and i'm sure that the you know the fact that it was his favorite piece of music is some some piece of um shtick that he had in you know some kind of humorous I cannot believe that the, his favourite piece of music was the theme from the Dam Busters, but it, it would have been some kind of humorous conversation that happened with somebody and it gets mm -hmm. taken out of context. And he he loved people. He loved making music um, accessible, you know, that everybody had the right to a good music education and participate in music. He was the uh, chorus master of Opera Australia. He was music director of Canberra Symphony Orchestra. He was the artistic director of both Oz Opera, which was a touring arm of Australian opera, and he was the artistic director of um, Opera Victoria, uh, no, Victorian Opera. I can't remember which one, that one replaced the other. He invented babies' proms. He would get up with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and do these kind of prom concerts for kids, um, toddlers and and whatever and in in australia I, I'm, I don't know it may be a worldwide thing but um he he was the master of getting up with an orchestra and an audience and playing stuff and explaining to the audience what was going on and breaking it down and saying okay brass play that little bit and then they'd play that and and then okay let's hear what the woodwinds are doing while that or give you background about the composer or um and and he was just so at ease with uh audiences of any age and any um level of skill it's just about impossible to meet a professional musician in australia who hasn't who wasn't taught by him went to a music camp 
friend of mine who's a very successful academic in um, in America. She taught playwriting at Harvard, and now she's at some uh, um, Brown University. Or she did a jazz course at the at the con at about the same time that I was that I was there, and she said the the most profound part of the the jazz course, the two year jazz course, was one hour she had with Richard Gill. He continues to be a powerful presence in in many people's lives, not the least mine. Well, it's wonderful to hear because, you know, for those of us listening who aren't Australian and have never been there, we're learning about this incredible master educator and, and, you know, human being that we we haven't heard about before. So that's really great uh, tribute. Yeah, he did. He lived in um, he lived in uh, in the States for a couple of years and taught Mm -hmm. um, Chico in um, in um, California. yeah, I mean, he he was big in the ORF movement, um, okay. and he'd go and do kind of keynote addresses at um, conferences around the world, and um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of community music, he must have had an influence on you, and I know you've done quite a bit of work. I was curious about your work with uh, 2D Arts, the accessibility in the arts, and the work you did there. I had seen some of the videos, you'd, very moving videos you'd created with young right. musicians who were visually impaired or completely blind. Yep. And I was curious about that project and how you got involved with it. Okay, so um, I was uh, I moved to Adelaide in 2001 and one of the first um, people that I looked up that I'd worked with or had connections to was Rosalba Clemente, who was the... By then, the artistic director of State Theatre of South Australia, and she was involved in a project that was a, a very interesting, interesting project. But it was coming up with some challenges, and she needed needed some help. It was being presented as part of the Adelaide Festival in a year that was um, where Peter Sellers, the uh, American opera and festival director, was the director of the Adelaide Festival, and it involved State Opera of South Australia and an organisation called Tutti, um, meaning everyone. Tutti had started a few years previously. It, in in Australia, there in all the capital cities, there are these um, residential homes for um, people with disabilities and in in um, Adelaide the the big one was Minda as a as a um, a kind of an activity for people in in this Minda home um, this wonderful woman Pat Ricks was asked to do a do some music and she went in and did some singing and that developed over time into the Tutti Choir, which involved both um, people with disabilities and people from the community who, when they'd go and hear and see, just were so entranced with the energy um, that they just wanted to be a part of it. So um, it's gone on uh, to be a big organisation in in South Australia uh, and it's got uh, a drama arm um, and a visual arts and but kind of the the heart of it has always been this this choir um, in the in the time when I first came in contact it was still very much the choir was the the choir was the thing and they were on stage there was there was also a, a, a band and there was act, there were professional singers and actors and all all that sort of stuff and then this the, the choir was was tutti and so i was engaged to to try and make uh, integrate them into um into the production and yeah it went it went well and i you know i did what they what they'd um asked and i got on really well with pat um who was the um, person who'd started the choir and she invited me to be more part of the organization and I did other other things uh, continue I continued to work with uh, Rosalba at State Theatre Company and wrote 
wrote some music for The Crucible and um, Death of a Salesman, which were also, um, you know, fantastic things to to be involved with. But yeah, continue to work in with Toot, Tootie in various ways. And Pat, Pat Ricks um, has also been, a, um, you know, talking about Ross Daly and Lindsay Pollock and Richard Gill. Pat, in a diff- very different way, has been a real inspiration she sees the world very differently to to me her you know she offers very different insights to the ones that um i naturally find um but she was aware i mean another another whole string in my what what i'm interested in is photography and um i, th- I think combination of photography and music leads you pretty naturally into into video um Mm. so pat was wanting to expand what was happening at 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 tutti there was there was already acting and visual arts stuff happening and she wanted to open she wanted to start a digital media program so she invited me to just to start that i'd made some recordings with some of the um some of the singers at in the tutti choir some of the young young people were in a particular program and we made some made some recordings and i thought this would be a great um way to combine to to utilize these recordings and kind of connect with uh the yeah both the drama and the uh visual arts components that were happening in 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 Tutti Arts, so made a series of videos over over a couple of years, uh, where I um, used the used the recording that we'd done, the audio recording, and mm-hmm. then um, worked with with the artists to devise um, you know visual scenarios, you know storyboarding in some cases, um, and yeah there's some pretty uh, there's some pretty nice videos there that we that we made uh and they really at the time felt like uh yeah a very a, a great way of combining all the different things that were going on in Tutti arts the you know the music the the a, a lot of them feature um you know people acting and and cert- certainly there's lots of um opportunity for for the visual um crew to come to to contribute yeah and then that i guess the skills that i um developed in in there in that in that role i've then gone on and made a couple of videos subsequently one in um uh new zealand um price tag that uh i did in a school that i was teaching at and then a couple of years ago i did one at at the local primary school where i where I teach now in in Brisbane, um, so yeah, it's a it's a really very labour intensive, but it's a pretty satisfying thing to to do when you you know you shoot and direct and edit and you know that's um, yeah yeah it's good fun. Yeah, I saw them, and I saw the more recent one you did with the kids. It was really charming. And so the artists you were working with who were visually impaired, was it meaningful for them that you were making a video? Like, I understand one of the girls, she had lost her her sight gradually so she could remember colour. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it looks really, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, that, that, that one I, I think is pretty, pretty moving, that, um, that colours video. Um, that was a song that Anika and Pat Ricks, who I mentioned before, co-wrote. Um and when i started thinking about making that that video i was talking to anika's parents and they they still live about 5 hours north of adelaide and you know anika was having have appointments with uh, you know various kind of eye surgeons and mm-hmm. i'm not sure what kind of mologists they were ophthalmologists or um Diff- different people and because she was living so far away it was it was not like oh pop in next week so um the 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 doctors said oh can you can you you know make some 
can you film what's happening and and so that we can see what, what how a development is mm -hmm. so when i went got round to um doing this video wendy uh, anika's mother turned up at my place with this pile of photo albums um and i think her anika's brother bronte had um digitized all these all these movies that they that they'd recorded so i just had this unbelievable um resource of all these videos and photos from anika's childhood so when in the song it says uh, you know i see blue i could just look through um you know mm. and there was there was a photo of her in with all this blue stuff i see green and then you know oh there's a video of her doing this with all this green and then we shot um then we shot stuff at the age that anika was when we made the the video but it, it was just such a such a gift having all that um all, all those resources uh from different points in her life that finishes up being pretty pretty moving but in in some ways so yeah as you say anika had some sight and she still has memory of seeing color mm -hmm. but jason who was in um, Folsom prison blues was yeah. born completely blind but when i sat down with him and yeah, explain what what I had in mind. He, I I don't I don't know how it's possible. He's got such a visual memory, a, a visual kind of imagination. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, so the first scene can be like this, and we can have, you know, um, Talon can come and go doing this, and then Joel can come in from that direction, and then and they can be wearing this, and the, and and then we can go, or or we could do this, and and or we could do this, and so it's like six different ideas for the first scene, and then. Uh, similar number of this and say um we're just making we're just making one video at the moment we just need you know we need to make one decision but his his visual imagination was just completely over the top and mm. uh I, I don't know how that how that works but he was he was great to to work on that with um and you know we used we used his his ideas and you know he had really strong ideas on who should play which roles in um in the in the movie and yeah that's what we that's what we did i'd, I'd have to say it does mean something i know uh an, another friend has not, nothing to do with Tutti, uh frankie armstrong that um she's now in her early 80s um very important um she's known as the godmother of the natural voice movement and in the last few years i've done a few um, concerts with her singing uh music of of brecht with uh music by kurt Weil and hans eisler and stuff like like that um anyway just recently saw her she's constantly her, her vision is virtually zero um mm. but she uses all these visual metaphors you know it's great to see you and she loves going to see things and you know mm. she loves going to see the theater and yeah it's kind mm. of <clears throat> on a rational level sometimes a bit hard to reconcile how that would be the case but that that is that is the case mm -hmm. interesting so in terms of working with children you've t been a teacher for many years in many different settings like working from preschools all the way to high school band yep and i'm curious um how your approach has changed over the years you know uh being a parent as well has that affected your ideas about musical education um well again you know richard richard gill is um you know constantly a constant source of uh, inspiration about mm -hmm. how how to make it how to make music education um accessible and interesting and relevant and important and all those things um and i i guess it kind of connects a bit to the to the tutti scenario i mean i i kind of that there's a part of me that thought Okay, I don't want to be working with these people with disabilities and making allowances for the fact that they've got disabilities. So I just thought about it for a while and eventually decided, okay, well, I won't. I'll just work with them. Mm -hmm. And if there's something they can't do, then 
that will become apparent. Mm -hmm. But that's not your starting point. Your starting point is we're going to make music. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the same for me with working with kids. You know, obviously you choose repertoire that's going to be a, a possible, mm. but within that, you then, you just do it as well as you can. I, I do my side as well as I can, and I try and get them, I try and make as many helpful suggestions and lead, lead the rehearsals in a way to make it sound as good as it possibly can. Uh, and forget about the fact that they're in year five or um, we're just we're we're here together working on making this sound as good as it possibly can. I'm the director. I'm the one who needs to be saying stuff to make it better in in the same way that um, you you would with with any group of people. You're, you're constantly listening to how can this be more in tune, more in time, more um but all of those things, uh, how can we make this more meaningful and how can we make this um, speak to us in, um, yeah, in meaning, the, trying to find the meaning there. I have quite a big co-curricular program at the primary school that I teach, you know, a ukulele group, a year five guitar, year six guitar, a senior choir, a boys choir, um, and this year we're doing a musical, although we don't know what it is yet. Um, and that's on that's being at the school two days a week, and then teaching wow. um, year four, five, and six classroom music as well. Um, but to me, the the core of what I'm there for is the co-curricular stuff, making making ensembles happen, and um, yeah, that's 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 what it's all about. Philip, are you there like in the morning before classes and do you, how do you fit in all those rehearsals with them? Uh, so by more mornings before school, uh, mm -hmm. and i I don't take a morning tea break or a lunch break. So yeah, there's rehearsals every, um, every break and before school, which I can do because I'm only there two days a week. I probably couldn't sustain that five days a week. What's your eating schedule like on those days? I'm curious. <laughs> Eating. Um, so there's uh, the class finishes the first first session finishes at eleven o'clock and the rehearsal starts at ten past. So you've got ten minutes that you can. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's okay. fine. So ukulele. I know when you lived in New Zealand, you had um, mentioned to me before when we spoke that ukulele is huge there, and I know you have one of your ukuleles with you, and it's a great instrument for for accessibility, right? It's not very expensive. People can play in groups. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, the, I mean, I've had a, I've had a ukulele of one sort or another since the 1970s when, I don't know whether the people who were part of the kind of 1920s um, resurgence or, you, you know, it was big in the early, around that, that period, people had bought them there were kind of dying in the 1970s. Okay. So there were all these kind of historic instruments coming on the market. Um, and in fact, I think the first instrument I bought was like a Royal Hawaiian, um, which would now be, you know, a hundred plus years old mm -hmm. and. I think I think in these deceased estates uh, in the 70s, these these instruments um, became available, and and um, it wasn't a very trendy instrument in the 70s. It was a bit of, it was a bit of a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in Australia, in my perception of it, um, and there's cer certainly been a, a renaissance since then. Um, I've got no idea what was happening in, in New Zealand at, at that time, but it's absolutely standard in, um, in a classroom in, um, in New Zealand to walk in and there's a, a whole set of ukuleles on the wall. Two friends of mine who I, I got to know fairly early on when I moved to, um, when I moved to New Zealand, Mary Cornish and Maria Winder had 
started a program in in New Zealand, partly in response to the fact that they saw um, music teachers' resources being diminished and trying to provide a way of music programs continuing to to happen in schools with with teachers who weren't necessarily trained musicians and i think the ukulele is a perfect instrument for that in that it's pretty easy to figure out how to play a chord and it's pretty easy to figure out how to read for example tablature as a as a leader of a ukulele program in in a class you don't have to be the best player in the room you you just need to be able to um you, you, it's more about the the management side and you know perhaps tuning the instruments and getting the using the resources but you don't need to be out there demonstrating everything and inspiring um, inspiring the kids by showing them perfectly how to play something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen it time and time again where, uh, you know, these programs flourish just because there's a teacher there who's committed to it and uh, has, has the right skills, but the right skills don't, in, don't have to include being a fabulous player. As against, for example... I don't know whether there are too many successful recorder programs in the world where the person leading it doesn't play the recorder at least, you know, to a a reasonably high standard. I mean, it's, that's an instrument where you need to you need to be able to model good sound on on the recorder to hope that your um, your class is going to sound sound good. And the recorder is the first instrument that I learnt, and I still I teach the recorder. So if if there was any sense in that that I was saying that ukulele good, recorder bad, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. And I have serious reservations um, about ukulele replacing the recorder. Mm-hmm. Like it's um, it certainly has has a role in a place where there's no alternative because it gets kids involved in music. In a, in a way that might not be possible any other way if they don't have trained music teachers. And I, certainly both in New Zealand and, and in Australia, there there's this, we don't have a music program anymore. We've got an arts program and music is one of the components. And you don't have to teach it all the time. You can just do it, you know, one semester out of four. And, and then the other time you do digital arts and drama and, um, you know, rather than obviously as it should be, music being something that happens every week with every every child um so that just the reality is that you know that that there aren't specialist music teachers in every school and classroom teachers are having to deliver it so in that context um it's better that there's something that works than than there isn't and so the so maria and mary um came up with this model where um, they would come up with a repertoire, they would record it, um, and they would put out a, a book and a school would buy into this program and they would get these resources. And at the end of the year, kids from all these schools that had learnt this repertoire would come together in this massed festival. And, you know, some years there were like three and a half thousand kids who'd learnt the same, the same repertoire and they're up in, um, and we used to have it in a in a sports arena just outside of Auckland, and the the kids would all be in the in the audience stands, and the there would be a, a rhythm section down down the bottom, like on the edge of the athletics track, and um, there'd be all these kids, and they've learnt learnt all this stuff, and then suddenly they're playing it together in this massed uh, mass setting. Yeah, it's been a really um, really successful model. COVID kind of hit the getting together part of it um, and it's now going through a bit of a, a rethink about how to best deliver it and it it's, looks like it's moving more um, because that festival was in Auckland that made it a particular focus on it being attractive to people who could get to Auckland and now they're trying to make it more national and having more small um, events happening throughout the country. Um, but 
yeah, just to try to develop the model and and take uh, take what's what's good about it. Uh, and two two things from my point of view. One is that I have been pretty heavily involved in the last few years in pro producing the material that goes out to school. So I record the backing tracks, um, yeah, do the arrangements of the of the yeah the recorded material and help with the uh, production of the um, printed material. Um, and another thing, after this had happened for a few years, this kind of massed, uh, massed grouping, which they call the Kiwi Leles, um, it's pretty apparent that some kids are really into it and they want to, uh, so, uh, so not, not all of the pieces, but some of them, they include not just what chords can you play, but, um, little, little riffs and licks and things that people can get into and it and it's pretty apparent that some kids really get into into that and after mm -hmm. this had happened for a while uh realized well actually yeah there's a there's a place for those kids after they've kind of been involved in kiwi leles um and so that started uh I call it the ukulele development squad for a while um and then i took that over then that further developed into a senior squad for all the kids who'd been in it from the beginning, and then there, then we needed to have another a junior squad, and, and yeah, I mean I treated that like a chamber orchestra really, and started doing arrangements for two part, you know, concert ukulele one and two, tenor ukulele, baritone ukulele, oh, and okay. bass ukulele, so pretty much like a string orchestra, and you know you've got these kids who are um, you know, shredding all these riffs in the um, Kiwi Lele's desperate to to do do new things. So yeah, with at one stage was doing really intricate Mozart's Turkish Rondo and did a little you know, which you can um, yeah. you when you've got that range of of instruments and pitches, you can actually. Uh, you do it in D minor, not A minor, but um, it just works. You can play the whole thing. Done lots of lots of arrangements of for that um, that okay. lineup. Yeah. So, would you be willing to treat us to a little bit of ukulele music? Sure. When I in nineteen uh, sorry in twenty eighteen we took the uh, senior squad to um, Hawaii and went to, went to the um, Hawaiian ukulele festival and the senior squad played at that, which was pretty, pretty special. Um, and because I was over in North America, I thought it'd be interesting to go and check out another ukulele uh, festival. So I, I looked at the, possibilities date wise and there, there was one in Oregon at Bend, Oregon. Um, um, I met this incredible luthier, um, Pat McGowan. This instrument um, is the result of that meeting. Mm -hmm. Pat likes every, I don't know whether that comes over. Mm -hmm. um, can you see the little blue wattle underneath the eye? Yeah. Every, every instrument that Pat makes has a name okay. and a story. And I think he said to me that if, you know, if the person who's getting the instrument made doesn't, um, doesn't want to buy into that, then he just does it himself. But it's hard to imagine anybody not wanting to buy into that. So, um, because of the, because of my interest in birds, my connection with um, New Zealand and the ukulele, because that, even though I've had, uh, you know, instruments since the seventies, it really, all that stuff that I was just describing um, in New Zealand is, you know, just really took off there for me. Um, and so, yeah, the ukulele in New Zealand is very connected for me. So, um, so this is a kokako, which is a, um, an endemic New Zealand bird. And the other connection is that 
Um, it's, I mean, it's got this beautiful blue um, wattle underneath the underneath the eye. I think it might show there. Otherwise, it's a kind of this grey bird, and so the horrible English name for it is blue wattled crow, and the uh, Maori name is kokako, and you know it's kind of this pretty plain grey bird. And then when it calls, it's the most incredible thing you've ever heard. And I kind of like that with the ukulele. You kind of think, oh, yeah, it's just a ukulele. But, um, uh, yeah. This one isn't. Yeah. The Renaissance guitar is um, four strings tuned the same as a ukulele. Um, the ukulele arrived in... 1877, I think it arrived in Hawaii from uh, Port from Madeira, um, and it was the machete, um, which is very much like a Renaissance guitar. Um, so, and then it then it got the name ukulele in uh, when it arrived in Hawaii and changed slightly, but um, it's essentially you know from the same family of instruments and. Uh, so Renaissance guitar uh, music fits fits pretty perfectly onto the um, onto mm -hmm. the ukulele. Um, so I could play you a little bit of um, Renaissance guitar music. So this is Tour de Dion. Thank you. No worries. So speaking of early music, I know you play the theorbo and Baroque guitar, and um, you were involved with a Feto group in New Zealand, early music? Yeah. Yep, that's right. A Feto was just another one of those unexpected... I didn't go to New Zealand thinking, um, I'm going to get into the ukulele, and I'm going to join a Baroque group, and I'm going to do my Masters in Opera Singing. But... Um, is what happened. You know, we moved to an area where uh, I mentioned Mary Cornish and Maria Winder, who were involved in the, um, the New Zealand Ukulele Trust and the New Zealand Ukulele Festival. We moved to a pretty affluent suburb in, in Auckland where Mary Cornish was the music teacher at the, um, at the local primary school. And my kids went there and I met Mary and, you know, figured out this ukulele connection and you know that that happened and also the choral connection and she was doing a concert that's how I got involved in the choir thing which led to me making the video of um, price tag and also there was a, a woman teaching at the school doing kind of after-school lessons um, Carol Buckton and she was a kind of a recorder legend in in New Zealand and my kids had lessons with her and she knew you know just this all these coincidences which led me to meet um, uh, Polly Sussex who's a viol uh, fantastic viola de gamba player in Auckland and she's in this group Afeto and they had um, decided that they wanted a theorbo in their group there was a, a luthier formerly from um, New York living in Wellington, 
and his specialty was the orbos. So they mm -hmm. thought, okay, we'll commission Jason Petty to make us a theorbo. So they did, but they didn't have anybody to play it. So they asked me whether, whether I would like to learn how to play it. And I said, well, I'd love to, but um, I'm probably going to be moving back to Australia in about a year or so. And they said, oh, whatever, learn anyway and, you know, do some concerts with us. And so that's kind of what happened. But, but by the time I left, we'd, uh, we'd started to have a pretty good time. I was pretty good, pretty, pretty keen to make, to get a, rec a, a recording of, of what we were doing and, you know, just... So I pushed for us to make a, an, an album, but that was by mm -hmm. that stage I was leaving. So uh, we, yeah, it took a little while, but we did finish up making a, a CD together, uh, which I'm pretty um, happy about, very happy about mm -hmm. that we actually got to, got to do that. It's, it's, it's great having recordings of, you know, different things that you, that you do and, um, and yeah, I'm hesitant to use the word proud, but if I, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty pleased that we, mm -hmm. that we did it. And, um, yeah, got to record the Orbo and Vo uh, me playing for the Orbo and Jane Tanksley singing. And I played quite a bit with her, with me on Vihuela and her singing and then ensemble, mm -hmm. big ensemble stuff. And yeah, that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. So your partner, Dominique Schwartz, you've been following her around a little bit. People might wonder why you kept leaving um, your professional situations and going to something different. Yeah, she was with the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, for 28 years. She was with a program called Foreign Correspondent. She was the inaugural reporter on that, um, travelled all over the world. Um, for six years doing doing that. Uh, we met, met towards the end of that when she was looking at ways of moving on um, and she got the job as Middle East correspondent for the ABC which is why we moved to, yeah, Jerusalem was the, that's the place, I think the two biggest populations of journalists in the world are Washington and Jerusalem and uh, so we were part of that whole world for three years and then when we moved back to Australia um, she became the ABC's um, 7 p.m. news TV news anchor in uh, in Adelaide which is why I lived there and then we moved to Auckland because she was the um, ABC's New Zealand and Pacific correspondent for four years and then we moved to Brisbane mm -hmm. and then the ABC kind of suffered major cuts and she was made redundant um, so she's left the ABC much wow. against her After will. After all that time. It's, it's a lot like yep. Canadian journalists I'm sure other places as well. Right. Yep. Wow that's that's uh, really... Is she finding... Um, new directions for her career um yeah she or... she was very very driven as soon as she found out that um she was going to be leaving the abc to get another job mm -hmm. and she's um yeah she's uh had a, got another job pretty much straight away and then has moved to another role with um pew charitable trusts which is a big um us based um environmental um yeah so she's doing some great working on great projects um one, one of them being increasing protection for Australia's sub-Antarctic islands. Um, mm. And yeah, some really good stuff in that space. Excellent. Good for her. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about briefly your, your album, uh, Banksia. Is that it? Am I saying it right? Okay. Yep, yeah. Banksia, yeah. With, um, it's very, with a violinist, Jude Edison. Is that how you say That is name? That is indeed how you say it. Yep. Yeah, it's it's really lyrical and whimsical and kind of indifferent. Um, I, I hate you know defining what the music sounds like, but I was wondering yeah. if would it be possible to share a track of that on this episode? Absolutely, yeah. You can yeah? share any, anything. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the first day I went to the WA Conservatorium of Music, which was in 1984, um, I I could play, you know, reasonably well classical guitar, and I, I had very little other musical education. Um, and on the first day that I was there, I met this um, young woman, a couple of years younger than me, and she had been, I think, the top or the second top or something in the previous years, um, high school music um, grades. And that, so from a totally different world from me, I didn't, I didn't do music at school. I yeah, had very little background. And she was also, I think, the leader of the WA Youth Orchestra uh, and had been playing violin forever and her mother was the you know the librarian at the orchestra and all her sisters and um, brother played orchestral instruments and so from a totally different world but in some ways we were kindred spirits and um, we connected pretty strongly right from the first moment and we finished up sharing a house um, and she went off and did all sorts of other things, um, but we've always stayed connected. And some, yeah, I don't know exactly when. We've we've always talked about, oh, wouldn't it be good to play some more together and blah, blah, blah. And a couple of years ago, we thought, okay, let's do it. So she came over to Brisbane. She lives on, uh, she still lives on the West Coast. Uh, she came over, I don't know, we had, four or five days where we just workshop some ideas and uh, some of her her tunes, some of my tunes, and we worked on some pieces that she'd written melodies for and I, I worked some chords, chords on. So yeah, we're very long-term friends and it was very personally rewarding to work work through making making an album together in that way there were several visits back and forth where we would uh, refine the arrangements and we did we did some recording and then realized no that's just not what we want to do and then finally came up with something that we were pretty happy with to, to finish this off i thought you've you've uh, referred a few times to your work with photography and nature and if you could just speak to that briefly how you I I think as a young child you were fascinated with the frogs and and birds but how that it's a big part of your life um if you could just speak to that briefly yeah again going back to the mentor thing I mean I I went to pretty radical um non-conformist schools um inconceivable in kind of you know, I, I think about the schools that I teach at and have taught at and think about the kind of schools that I went to um, and, you know, duty of care and, uh, you know, the, the kind, at the beginning of every year, the sort of things as a teacher you need to sign up for about, you know, mandatory reporting and first aid and CPR and you know, data sharing and, you know, all these, all these kind of things. And I think about, you know, total, absolute free for all lack of any of that, uh, at the school I was at. Um, anyway, there were some, you know, there were a whole lot of rat bags there with, uh, rat bag families, but the art teacher, um, her family were the, um, were the people who uh, brought jet boats to the Abrolhos Islands off the west coast of Western Australia for cray fishing. Um, and um, we would go on school camps to these this incredible place, the Abrolhos. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a bird, the lesser noddy, which is a tern, which breeds only on the Abrolhos and the Seychelles, uh, so it's a major kind of birding uh, mecca for Australian birders, um, which I kind of, I already knew, you know, when 
when I was going there. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I think I was, you know, first caught by dinosaurs as many six-year-old um, kids are, but it just never, it just never left. Um, so mm. dinosaurs, um, lizards developed into lizards and birds. And at one stage I had to look after my next door neighbor's um, aviary while they went on holiday and it was a walk through aviary and I'd go in and sit there and, um, you know, he had these beautifully kind of landscaped aviaries with ponds and grasses and stuff. And, and these beautiful finches had come down and sit and they'd come and eat the, the fresh grass and have a wash. And I was just completely besotted and nothing's changed. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm still exactly the same, you know, as I was when I was six. I'm totally uh, obsessed with music, lizards, birds, um, and nothing's really developed. I'm exactly the same person. Um, so, okay. So we were going on these school camps to the Abrolhos, and one of the people that was a student there, her father was the head of the Division of Natural Sciences, Barry Wilson, and he was an expert in seashells and he came over uh, on one of the camps for a few days and he brought some scuba gear and um, um, <laughs> took kids out doing kind of scuba diving and um, but he kind of he realized that I was pretty keen on lizards and birds and um, and knew a reasonable amount. And he said, would you like a, you know, would you like to come and do a hol school holiday job in the, in the museum? I'll see whether I can organize it. And, you know, didn't take me long to, um, absolutely want to do that. So I think I was 11 when I started, um, doing that. Mm -hmm. working every day of every holidays you know we'd break up from school on friday i'd be in the museum on monday and i'd be there until the last possible second before we went back to school and i did that for three years and finally the museum said okay you seem to be pretty keen on this should we uh would you like a full-time job here we'll see whether we can get you know the education to uh department to let you leave school early so i left school when i was 14 and um worked in the bird and reptile department of the museum and yeah my boss was um glenn store who um an absolute legend in the australian both ornithology um which is birds and herpetology which is reptiles um described so many species of uh, reptiles and um did these major revisions of all these, um, yeah, it's, yeah. He's he's a huge figure in the in those in those spheres in 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 Australia, and he was he was my boss, and very different to you know the relationship that I had with people like Richard Gill, but you know incredible, uh, um, yeah, influence on on my how i how i kind of interacted with that with that world um so let me understand and, did you not go to high did you not go to high school philip when you well, said you left school at 14 yeah it was pretty yeah, I'm, I'm, i was at school before then but um i was doing bits of year 11 maths and bits of bits of nothing and I, it was just so unstructured it's hard hard to even know how to answer that it was i was okay. at high school but okay. um it was such a hippie free-for-all that um yeah anyway that's that's the way um again you know i met Lindsay through um a friend of mine there who was the sister of Lindsay's then girlfriend so if i hadn't gone to that school i wouldn't have gone to the museum and i wouldn't know Lindsay. yeah um and again, through that another branch of that connection, I found the teacher that um, kind of set me on a serious classical guitar path 
So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so much of my adult life is connected to that, that schooling. Um, and one of, yeah, one of the things early, early on at the museum, I, I, um, got involved in photography and we'd go out and we'd look for reptiles and, um, in those days, it was very hard to take bird photos. People um, didn't have, I mean, a big telephoto lens is relatively cheap these days. It certainly wasn't in those days, um, but you could take high quality um, photos of uh, with, a, with a macro lens. And, you know, I got a cheap camera and a cheap uh, macro lens and a flash and I had people that showed me how to do it. And so, you know, some of my photos from the late seventies, early eighties are still being used in books, um, books now. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, like, you know, like everything else, I just, uh, I'm still really interested in it. I still go out looking for lizards and frogs and try and take photos of them and, um, and in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, I've had access to, uh, lenses that have enabled me to take some photos of birds as well, which is, um, a very different activity. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nice stuff to do. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. And so to, to close out this, um, episode, Philip, I was just wondering if you could just reflect, it, it strikes me that what's affected you a lot is not only your own openness, but the opportunities you've had to just follow your own interests in a really deep way, not, not in a superficial way. Like as particularly as a teenager and a young man, you're able to really just go with these opportunities. Do you have any ideas about that in terms of um, how you would mentor young people now or looking back on your life as a young person? Yeah, I think one of my, I mean, I don't think I'm the greatest player in the world or the greatest, you know, anything necessarily, but I try and connect with things as deeply as I, as I can. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, I mean, I, I love the, the fact in music that there are so many, um, so many styles of music that you can explore so many instruments. I'm a complete sucker for different instruments. Um, just finding finding your own meaning in you know whatever it is that you're that you're involved with um, being open to opportunities that present themselves i I've had absolutely no kind of career path aspirations I just you know here I am here's a here's a door go through it most of the time there's something good to be got through even if it isn't, even if you don't stay there for a long, long time, there's, there's something you can, you can get out of it. Yeah. Be kind. Um, yeah. I mean, I would like to think that, that when I'm working with young people that I see that I try and find, um, things in them in the same way that people have helped me over the over the years it's a it's a very powerful uh model being taught well and kindly for you to go on and um do it in a similar in a similar way and i hope that i do justice to the people that have inspired and nurtured and supported me Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure um, getting to know you today. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great privilege to, to speak to you and thank you for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thanks for following the series on your favorite podcast player and sharing your favorite episodes with your friends, all of which help find new listeners. I have lots more episodes coming in this season three with a fascinating diversity of musicians and their stories and music. Have a great week.